Welcome. So um, this webinar is put on by the Maine New Farmers Project. And let me just share my screen. So this is our website. Um, we're just at um, extension.umaine.edu slash new farmers. Um, we have a lot of information on this site. Um, basically, we're the arm of Cooperative Extension um, who reaches out to new farmers and helps you connect with resources that helps you start a farm. Um, and what I wanted you to, to see on this site is that we have a calendar of events um, and this calendar um, will show you not only extension activities related to new farmers, um, but it will show you other um, organizations um, across Maine um, that are putting on programming for new farmers. Um, so, again, that's under the calendar. Um, and we also have a newsletter sign up which is this chicken right here. Um, and that will, um, if you click on that and you sign up for our newsletter, you'll just receive one email a month. Um, and it just um, recaps what's happening in that month um, in terms of what's on our calendar. Um, so I just wanted to um, show you that. And um, now I would like to introduce our speaker for today. So this is the first um, uh, webinar of a four webinar series. Um, and today we have um, Jerry Vistein. Did I say it right, Jerry? Yes, she did. Okay, good. Um, and um, sh Jerry is a conservation biologist whose focus is carnivores and their vital role in maintaining the biodiversity of our planet. Her work centers on educating our main community about carnivores, their ecology, their complex cultures and history, and how we can coexist with them. She achieves this by presenting various programs on carnivores to us and us to diverse audiences all over the state of Maine, working closely with our farmers who wish to learn coexisting skills by creating outreach projects with artists, musicians, and puppeteers, offering experiential programs for our children, giving support to educators of our children, and collaborating with diverse community and agency organizations. She's the founder of Coyote Center for Carnivore Ecology and Coexistence, whose mission is to share with community members the science we know of our returning carnivores and the skills to live well with them. So with that, um, Jerry, you are up. Oh. Okay. We shall start? Yes, you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Can everybody see it? Yes, that looks good. Okay. Well, welcome, um, welcome to each one of you. Um, as a biologist, um, I was just speaking to Chris. I am, I, I feel so blessed living here in Maine with all our farmers. It's just a unique and wondrous place, and it's my role as a biologist to be a support to our farmers. Um, and so, I love giving these talks because uh, um, it is a, as a support to you um, in what you do. So um, we're going to talk, I think Chris said, for maybe about 45 minutes. Um, you know, my talks can either be shorter or longer, depending on how many stories I put in there, okay? Because the stories are important things, uh, help us to remember things too. Um, and then we'll have some questions. So if you have some questions on any of the things I'm talking about, um, jot a note down, and then we'll kind of talk after. I'm also leaving with you a lot of wonderful information that you can have. So towards the end, I will be uh, sharing that with you um, because you're just touching the tip of the iceberg. There's so, so much to know, uh, but we'll start, okay? Um, so I'd like to start by saying, um, I'd love to say that as a biologist, that the farming um, is a community affair. And um, and so it, it's the, the, the thing is, is that farming 
is a community affair, not only among our human communities, but also the larger community of life that we have here in our own state of Maine. And so, okay, let's go next. Sometimes it doesn't want to, hmm. We didn't practice that one. Does it want to go? There we go. Okay. So your farm is an ecosystem, right? And it's your home and it's the place where you raise your farm animals, but it is also an ecosystem. And then in that ecosystem, all members of that community need to be there in order to be a really healthy, vibrant, biodiverse ecosystem. And so this is what we're going to be talking about here. So we're going to step back here a little bit. As I was telling you, uh, telling Chris, is that um, history is a big piece that I play, I, that I always bring into my work as a biologist because our human history um, affects us today. So, you know, we as humans, we were hunter gatherers for the greater percentage of the time that our species has been on the planet. And farming has been a relatively short period of time that we farm. So when we did, when back then, our fellow humans, they domesticated wild animals, all right? And there was kind of an ancient unspoken contract with these wild animals that they were domesticating. And part of that, I considered that contract was, you will give me your eggs and your milk, and your fiber, right? your flesh, your little ones, and your life, and your freedom. But in return, I will give you healthy, good food, fresh water, protection for you and your little ones at birth. And I shall also protect you from um, extremes in the weather. And I shall give you veterinary care. And I shall give you protection from predation. This is more or less our contract with wild animals when we domesticated them. So it's interesting, I'd like to share with you that before Europeans came about 500 years ago, our native people, our native people in this country never had domestic animals that they farmed with, right? The ones, the most domestic were their dogs and their dogs, as we, as we learned, were pretty wild. So our carnivores who lived before the Europeans came um, had no sense of what a domestic animal was was very new for them and was a whole new challenge for them um, in uh, dealing with um, this whole new scenario. And it continues to be today. So what the Europeans did, and history is so important too, this is really important piece understanding history of European history before they arrived here. And um, on my website, coyotelivesinmaine.org, I have a number of books there on European history and what happened when they came here and when they brought their farm animals. It's good to understand this for your sake, is that they, in, in Europe, um, first of all, they basically um, killed all the carnivores who lived there. Um, they didn't have an understanding whatsoever of the value of what they were doing. And they were very, very affected by um, myths that the, say, carnivores like wolves were, were demons, they were the devil. And this is very powerful. And sometimes we may laugh at it today, but it's very, very true And they brought that over. And so carnivores were, um, were a bad animal they were a violent animal and they, um, they needed to be done away with. And of course they were very successful in Europe doing that. So then they come to North America and here they come, say for instance, to our state of Maine. And what do we have? All kinds of wild animals, all right? We had wolves, we had cougars. You just keep going on and on with all this wonderful thing of wild animals living with their prey, okay? And so their first 
thing that they did. And also, a lot of these people that came from Europe were not farmers. They just escaped the cities. So they had no clue of animal husbandry practices and, and also and, and in reference to carnivores. So when this happened, their answer was to kill. And of course, as you know, they were very, very successful. So the 500 year history in our country has proved that killing is not protecting from predation. We see that today, and I can tell you a couple stories there too. It is not the solution. So I'll give you an example here from Maine, farm in Maine, um, a number of years ago, they, there's um, an area near where they live that's kind of like a, um, a, a place that's kind of a refuge for coyotes um, and the perfect place that coyotes usually would be to raise their families and feel safe. Um, but the farm was right next to it. And, um, and these particular farmers did not use any animal husbandry practices whatsoever. And they um, had very vulnerable animals like chickens. So they decided to trap the coyotes. So, they got permission to trap them. And what happened was, okay, they were gone. Now, two or three years later, the coyotes are back again. And so this is what happens is that part of really understanding the social system of coyotes and wild beings, especially your wild canids, is their territorial. So as long as you have a coyote, a coyote family in the territory, no other coyotes are going to come. But if you take them out of there, um, and other ones are going to come, and you're never going to know. And so that what happens is, um, I have farmers who live very well with coyotes here in Maine, and they always say, "Jerry, we sleep so well at night because they know they're coyotes, and the coyotes know them." And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, killing is not protecting from predation, and so we're living in a time of transition. And part of that transition is that we are knowing so much more about um, the whole system of who carnivores are and, um, and their value on the planet and how they work. And, uh, and of course, that's what, the, what I strive to do. And also, along with carnivores, you know, this huge understanding of, uh, of global warming, of what we as humans have done since the Industrial Revolution. So this great awakening that we are in and all of us who are living at this time, it's really an exciting time to participate in this transition. And our farmers are too. And so we're using part of that transition is using proactive animal husbandry practices. So it's not continually killing, but using it so um, you don't have to. So I'm gonna go through some of these for you now. So these are, sometimes I'll say to people, animal husbandry practices, some people don't quite know what that means. So these are examples of some animal husbandry practices that are very basic on your farm. So first of all, confining vulnerable livestock at night. All right, and of course, one of our most vulnerable ones are our chickens, all right? So our chickens need to be housed at night and I'm going to show you a little bit later on a picture of a particular carnivore that will get in anywhere it wants to if you don't have really secure housing. And so this is a big piece. And who are your vulnerable? Most of your wildlife are vulnerable. However, we can talk a little bit more later on about well, how about if they're out at night, especially goats and in the summertime. We can talk a little bit about that one protecting newborns and their mothers. Kind of in the past, and it was that when they were wild, um, mothers would go to the edge of the field, right next to the forest, and give birth to their calves or their young ones. Um, this we cannot do anymore, okay? When we're living with carnivores on our farm, our mothers and their babes need to be in the barn or near the barn in a protected place. We can talk a little bit more about that too. Re removing livestock carcasses. When I first came to Maine and started talking to our farmers, um, some of the people would say, yeah, I take uh, this, my cow died and I put it out there right in the forest. So the coyotes and bobcats and everything, they'll stay there and eat it and they won't come here. Just the opposite. 
this is the exact thing you don't want to do. I can't get into the whole complex, amazing social system, especially of intelligent uh, um, carnivores like coyotes. They are taught by their parents who their prey animals are, and they actually have a taste for it. So once you give them a taste for uh, um, a farm animal, they're going to remember and they're going to keep coming back. So that is something no. In the West, actually, there's a big, they're really organizing out there. They have a whole organization of the ranchers. They have a whole pile of dead cows, which happens a lot out there. They actually, the whole systems come, have come in and get the cows and they actually dispose of them in a safe way. So it does not draw the wolves and the grizzly bears. So they're doing that out West as well. So we're mixing vulnerable animals with larger ones. And the chickens are very vulnerable. Um, sheep may be more vulnerable in reference in comparison to cows. So you want to mix them. Sometimes even having chickens and geese um, is a difference. Also using flattery and intimate noisemakers and lights. I'm going to show you that on the next, uh, next slide. And these are to be used, I recommend, mostly um, at certain times of the year. Because you're dealing with very intelligent beings. It's like, oh, I know. Uh, that's not going to hurt me. So... Um, that's why you use them as special. And of course, one of the most important parts of animal husbandry practices is your human presence. Carnivores were not afraid of humans when the Europeans came across the country. They, um, they, uh, they did not run away from them. But because of the history in our country of how they were treated by humans, Europeans, as they crossed the country, they have great fear of humans. And so just your presence um, is enough for them to not be present. So here are these ones I'm going to show you. And you'll see more of these on my website, Farming in the Presence, uh, um, Farming um, with Carnivores Network.com. So I have these in a little bit more explanation context. So the fox lights. So while wild carnivores and like all wildlife are very, very careful that they don't get hurt. So they're very careful of anything that's new. It frightens them. And we can sometimes laugh and go, they're afraid of that. But the thing is brand new to them and they protect themselves by being safe. So with the fox lights, what happens is they come and these are all connected with solar, solar power too. So they're connected close around your fence. And as soon as they approach close enough, this light comes and swirling light frightens them and they run away. Same with the night guard. The night guard is a noisemaker. When they come, this really loud noise and they run away. Then there's flagery. Flagery, as you can see, this is flagery. They use it in the West a great deal on wolves and grizzly bears. Can you imagine? And you see how it's tied on a fence, okay? And they're like the plastic ribbons. I've been trying the hardest to find where do you get these. I haven't. I've had that great difficulty trying to get um, information from them in the West sometimes. So I suggest that you look for plastic red type ribbons like this. And about every three feet, you are putting them on your fence line. A carnivore like a coyote sees that. They will run away. They are terrified of it. Again, all three of these kinds of things are temporary. And I encourage you to use them at the time of the birth of the babies. So when your you're little goats, sheep, all the little lambs are being born, this is a really good time to be using these kind of things. Maybe sometimes in the winter, too, um, you may, well, be able to use it, too. So it depends. Every farm is different. Every farm has certain issues. So the other aspect of animal husbandry practices are guardian dogs, guardians. So guardian dogs have been bred in Europe in remote areas, mostly of Eastern Europe and in the Alps and the Great Pyrenees. So all the wolves were gone and the cats those mostly from all the places where people lived and farm. But they went to these remote areas and they were still there. And the shepherds were there. And so for thousands of years, the shepherds bred these guardian dogs. 
They are different than the, the little dogs that run after your sheep and get them to do what you want. Those dogs have a high predatory role. These dogs are highly maternal. As you can see, the little lamb is just resting on this Maremma, okay? She's a Maremma, a Maremma guardian dog, and she's from the Alps of, of, of Italy, right? So their role is to protect. They are very powerful. They are large dogs. Usually they're around 120 pounds. They, what they work independently. Um, they're not like the dogs that run around after your sheep. These dogs know what to do after their initial training with the farm. Um, and they are there 24 seven. They're out there all the time with them. I guess I could go on and on about these guardian dogs because they're um, really amazing in what they do and their capacity. And so I'm gonna share with you that on the website, Farming um, with Carnivores Network have links for each one of these guardian dogs and speaks a little bit more about them. And I suggest to like with everything with dogs in our world, and I'm sure you all understand this, there's always some possible abuse and breeding. So you always want to go through really uh, excellent breeders that are often recommended um, by their organizations. You'll see them website. Also on the Farm Farming with Carnivores Network website, um, there is a, um, a, a person, Peter Sancaro, who actually breeds Great Pyrenees dogs. He is in Massachusetts, and many of our, our, our farmers here in Maine actually got their dogs from him. He is top of the line. He goes to Europe and he gets purebreds of the highest level of breeding to be the best quality um, guardians for your dog. And he um, is very, very responsible. And he said to me, he says, I want to do this because I want our farmers to be able to live well with carnivores in a non-lethal way. And this is my way of giving to them is breeding these dogs. Great stories about them, great stories. Um, so this is um, uh, the Maremma, all right? I show you a couple of them. This is a Congo, all right? And these are Congos too. We have farmers here in Maine who have Congos too. You know, most of these guardian dogs are light. They're either white or tan in, in color. They kind of blend in with them. And this is kind of like how they are in Europe. So these are up in the high areas, you know, of Yugoslavia and places like that. And you'll see that these sheep are not fenced in, all right? And so these guardian dogs that we have gotten, so how did they get here? So we have them here. And this only happened since 1970. A professor from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst went to Europe and he sought out these guardian dogs all over Europe. And there are a number of different kinds, depending on where they are and their history. And they're all kind of a little bit unique in their own way because they live in a relatively small area. They're not moving all over Europe. Um, and one of the things they find is that when he brought them back, and they've been used out west a great deal, all right? And we're seeing a lot more that we're using them here now. And one of the things that's different is that in Europe, there was no fencing. So these dogs um, protected their sheep with no fencing. Here in Maine, our farms have fencing, okay? So you have your goats, you have your sheep, you have your chickens, right? And go on and on. They're inside a fence. And so is the guardian dog. The guardian dog is never to run outside that fence. They are always to stay with, with their charges. And it's amazing that these, these guardians have adapted to that. Some of them are better than others. Some Pyrenees, as well as others, have to be trained and retrained by their people. And that is a piece, too, um, that I want to share with you. And I'm just touching upon this because I'm going to give you a lot more information to read about some other really cool things from a real leader in this regard, um, is that these... Um, these dogs, when you come, usually you, know, you get them when they're a, a pup, one or two years old. Um, usually, I not say two years old, but when they're a pup, okay? So maybe they're 12 weeks old, 16 weeks old, all right? 
and they come to your farm, they are babies. They are not going to be guarding you yet. And, and they won't be real garden guards, serious gardens, until they're about two years old. They have that maturity, right? And the thing is, in that meantime, you are training them about the rules of your farm, just like you train your own domestic pets. Is this are the rules? Really important to do that and also to bond with them. Research has shown that the more the guardian dog is bonded to their farmer, the more successful they are. They want to please you. And they're very successful guardians. Um, and so there are three um, videos on the website as well. And one of them really shows you how fierce, two of them shows you how fierce that they can be. So one of them is um, by a film that was made by farmers here in this country. And it shows the behavior of the guardian dog behind the fence with the goats as the coyotes are yipping and yapping. The coyotes aren't doing anything. They're just on the other side of the fence. And let me tell you, it shows how they go into action, but within the fence, okay? There's another one, it's a real short one, and I believe this one is from Europe, because it isn't, uh, the guardian dog is not behind a fence, but it shows how really, really powerful they are. And they are fearless when it comes to protecting their, uh, um, their animals from that. So I, I, I invite you to go see those. So these are great Pyrenees puppies, okay? These little guys have a long way to go to get to their maturity, all right? And um, if, if you ever wanna learn anything, of anything is I encourage you to uh, reach out to Peter Sanitcaro and he is in the website. He's the only one down on the website where it says meet the farmers. Um, he's an amazing man, very supportive to our farmers here in Maine. I encourage you. So these little guys have a lot to learn. And a lot of it they learn on your farm with your animals. And I've had so many farmers having a guardian dog is like, is part of the other joy part of their farm. It's a responsibility, but they delight in it. On the other half of that, if you don't like dogs or you are afraid of them, you should not have a guardian dog because bonding with them is very, very important. Okay. So, here are a couple books now that I recommend that you read. Both of these books are in our main libraries. I always make sure that things are in our main libraries. And I've seen both of them. So The Livestock Guardian Dogs, written by uh, um, Bennett Donor. She is my go-to person. She is a farmer in Michigan, southern Michigan. So their farms are very similar to those here in Maine. Um, she is an expertise in, in guardian dogs, been over to Europe as well, also works in the West as well. So she has a vast knowledge of these guardian dogs and, and the different ones. Her uh, next book is The Animal Predators and the Guardian Dogs. So she does a combination of two. It's important to know of the predators who live on your farm. Get to know them. Have them be neighbors you know. Um, it, it, it brings you a lot of peacefulness on your farm. That's just the beginning. I'm sharing you more information. However, if you don't like dogs and you're afraid of dogs, then another option, and we've just discovered this in this country, this is relatively, is donkeys. When horses run away from a carnivore, donkey runs towards them. And you know how donkeys sing. That call that they make is terrifying to a predator. And so, and if you look at their hoofs down there, look at their hoofs, one hit of that hoof can kill a predator. And do the predators know this? Yes, they do. They are very protective of themselves. So there is a sheep farmer here in Maine, the biggest sheep farmer here in Maine. And he has six donkeys. His guard donkeys and the coyotes are running around doing their ecological work on his farm. And if you ever go on their website, you don't see his sheep. You see faces of six of his donkeys. And again, it's one of these things that these guardians really add to the delight of the farmer on their farm. So and this is a role that they play. So now what I'm seeing is. No, also that we have great diversity of 
of um, predators here in Maine. And we'll talk about how um, each one of these guardians is effective with them, all right? Now, the next one are llamas, all right? So alpacas have become very, um, very favorite here in Maine because they um, we make beautiful things from them and their, their coats are with that. Uh, llamas are from South America. And of course they have often been made to be carry heavy things. But um, llamas um, are also, we've discovered are also really great protectors. As you can tell from the sheep, the sheep are standing behind this llama. They know who their protector is, okay? And it's the same thing. You look at their size, you look at their call. If you are a 35 pound coyote, okay, or a 20 pound fox, you see this coming towards you, you're splitting real fast, okay? You are not going to be around. And so these are other ones that, and some people refer them. Also, it has to do with your farm. Is your farm near a lot of other people? Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you about um, David from Wellscroft Farming in um, um, New Hampshire. And he has llamas and guardian dogs, and he has them for different reasons. So remind me if I forgot. Okay. Um, one thing I suggest, if you have a really nice big farm and you're rural, the um, way the guardian dogs do their work, they bark. And of course, most of that work, and they're not barking just to bark. They do not bark. They're barking with carnivores. Or they're barking if something is not right. They just have this sense. I was at one of these farms that had alpacas. They actually had guardian dogs protecting the alpacas. And we were there and they had um, the alpacas in this small pasture with the guardian dog in them. And all of a sudden the guardian dog was starting to get real antsy. And so what it did was the alpacas that actually moved, talked to the alpacas in a way we humans don't get and told the alpaca, you all get real close now, get real, real close, tuck in, all right? And he started barking around and barking around. We didn't have a clue why this dog was doing that. What we figured was that most probably a deer was walking around in the woods over there. And they were very alert to this big thing out in the woods that might hurt them. And as soon as that deer was gone, or whoever it was, and it might have been a carnivore too that we never saw, as soon as it was gone, she let the alpacas know, it's cool now, you can let go. It's amazing the communication they have. It just blows you away the intelligence of these all these animals and how they're communicating with them. Okay. I'm watching my time. Okay. All right. So fencing. Fencing, as David from Wellscroft Fencing says, is the first line of defense. You can have you when you have vulnerable animals, they need to be fenced. Okay. And they need to have electric fencing. So I'm highly going to encourage you to look into Wellscroft Fencing, and they are in Harrisville, um, New Hampshire. And if you've ever been to the Common Ground Fair, he's the one who brings his dogs, his dogs that move his sheep around. I always call him an adopted manor. He's really valuable. He has a fencing company, but he also is a farmer at all kinds of vulnerable animals. Okay? And he lives up against a conservation area of all the full rye of, of carnivores. And so, uh, but he also lives in a town so he has a llama um, most of the time to protect his animals because he can't have his dogs barking in town, but he also has great Pyrenees when they're moving around. So here is an example kind of like, this is Ida. She's on the Apple Creek farm in Bodenham. She is from Peterson, apparently. She's a great Pyrenees. And he, that's another thing amazing that these dogs were never in Europe trained to protect chicken. But they have learned to protect chickens too. So having guardian dogs protect chickens. And if you notice, you look very closely towards the back, there is electric fence there too, a fencing. It's the kind of fencing that's moved around all the time, okay? And then they're a very, very um, secure home that they go into. 
Um, it's really great. I suggest encouraging some of these leading farmers that you ask them to come time if you ever have a chance to come on to their farms. They're great teachers. So this is kind of an example of some of that. So these are some factors to remember. Time goes so fast, doesn't it, Chris? It's like I'm looking at the clock. It's like, oh, oh move it along, Jerry. So factors to consider. Age and um, type of your livestock. What kind of animals do you have? Are you having chickens or you have cows, right? That's really important. You have goats. The season of the year. Season of the year is really important too. This example of the goats. So there's a, a wonderful farm um, um, in mid-coast Maine who have goats and they do everything right. They have a guardian dog, they have electric fencing, that they move around. And she's taught me that the goats really graze much better at night than they do during the day because it's so hot for them. So what they do is they're out there at night, they're a distance from the farmhouse, but behind electric fencing and the guardian dog is present. Um, from time to time, the guardian dog is barking, the coyotes are yipping, and in the morning, they see coyote scat going down one of their trails, and the goats are fine. And this is the kind of thing that time of the year, when it's real hot, you have to think about how I want to have my animals out there grazing, but I want them to be safe, something like goats. But also wintertime is another whole thing. How successful is the electric fencing in wintertime? So location of size of the pasture. A lot of our farmers, their pastures are away from the home. That is important to remember. And how often are people present? Some of our farmers also work jobs before they really get into farming completely. That's a really important piece. And lastly, what's happening around your farm. And we have time, I wanna to talk to you about that because that is vitally important. So moving on to, why, why coyotes with carnivores on your farm? Why do we wanna move in that direction? Oh, what a hassle for all this. Really important. So we're in time of transition. You notice how Jerry's starting to move along because I saw my time. So, so important to get to know your carnivores and why we need them and why we want them here. That's a whole new shift, isn't it? A whole new shift. So here's coyote. Coyote in Maine is the keystone carnivore of Maine. Wherever wolves are not, our coyotes play the role of keystone. The keystone, think of the keystone that the, that the, um, the, that the Romans built in their keystone arches. Take the keystone out, the whole arch falls apart. Coyotes play a really important role as that keystone. When they um, hunt any animal and are successful killing them, they affect the whole system in positive ways. I can't get into all that now. <laughs> That's another whole talk I give. Yeah. But they play a really important role in that. And you can go see that talk because I have talks on, on coyote lives in Maine.org. It was filmed by a filmmaker there, that talk actually on coyotes themselves. So as a keystone, the services they provide your farm, rodent patrol, super important. Where your animals are not fenced in, coyotes are doing rodent patrol. And as we know, rodents carry tremendous disease. Also balancing large herbivore populations. It's really important to balance these populations and not keep them staying on your farm. So in reference to deer, use of all who have um, um, hoofed animals, domestic hoofed animals, deer carry the brainworm. And if, if they stay in your pasture at night grazing, um, they can have your own animals be susceptible to the brainworm. So having carnivores on your farm, what happens is our deer start acting like real wild deer. Uh-oh, um, the carnivore is here. I can't stay here for too long. I keep moving around, moving around. And that's what the carnivore does. It gets the herbivores to move. And we learned that if any of you learned anything in Yellowstone National Park, that is what the wolves have done to the elk to create an amazing system there now. So same with coyotes here in Maine on your farm. And I suggest too that those of you who are vegetable farmers, having coyotes on your farm, let me tell you, the deers know it. They're not going to sit out there as, as a cow would and eat all your hard work. Coyote is going to be present and they will know it and they will move on. So that, that is affecting that large herbivore behavior. We're not even talking about killing them. We're talking about affecting their behavior. 
controlling the activity of mesocarnivores. Okay, one of our mesocarnivores are our raccoons, okay? We have a farmer here in Maine um, outside Unity. Now, he has the best corn on the cob in the world at my farmer's market, and I go see him. And he always tells me, the coyotes are here, or they're not here this year, and the raccoons are really doing a job on my corn. He recognizes that the coyote's presence of walking through their corn is keeping the raccoons on the move. So that's we talk about that balance of the system, of the ecosystem, and balancing also small herbivore populations of your rabbits, woodchucks, all that. I could tell you stories about woodchucks and orchards. A lot of our orchards really like coyotes to be present. Um, it's all free service coyotes give them. Woodchucks can really do a job on, on orchards. So what happens as a result, coyotes help control disease on your farm. They protect the trees, plants, and flowers in your yard from being eaten up by large herbivores. And as a result, create habitat for the birds, the butterflies, and bees on your farm. Um, and so it's just so important um, for, uh, for their, their role that they play. And, and as you can see, carnivore plays a huge role in biodiversity, and we know they're putting a huge role in biodiversity um, of the planet because um, what's really important for most species is habitat. And when their habitat's beaten up by large numbers of herbivores, um, they're, they're not present anymore. So that creating a biodiversity is to play an important role and it's on your farm. And therefore they, have, they maintain this healthy farmland for you and your animals. So I love this picture of coyotes because I want to show you just this. You're dealing with this intelligent being, intelligent being and really cool. Our native peoples revered them. So you want to be successful in living with them. So you want to give them habitat. And of course, here in Maine, most of farms have habitat. They have forested. So if you have this refuge for them where they bring up their babies, okay? And they also that they have their wild prey. So, and by doing some, when you support that, you also want to support stable populations. How you support a stable population, you want one family of coyotes to live there only. They are very territorial. If you have one family of coyotes, you are creating um, a stable social situation, democratic structure in which that one family are the only ones who live there. And what they will do, they will lead to a territorial defense. They will not let any other coyotes live there. It's a matter of survival for them. There's only enough food for them. This family, and it really helps you to understand that. See, so you want this one family of coyotes to live there, okay? And you want them to get to know you and you get to know them. There is a rancher in Wyoming. Let me tell you, I went to school in the University of Montana. Wyoming is a rough place. He put a whole article in their paper about his protector coyote, all right? He calls them their guard coyotes. At first he didn't, he was first like, okay, let's get the gun and shoot him. And there's, whoa, 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 back up here. He's watching what the coyote is doing. So his, when they were giving birth, they had all the afterbirth. And that's what the coyote was doing, was eating afterbirth. But consistently the same coyote. Another coyote attempted to come, pushed him away. So he had this one coyote who's being really cool and doing cool things on his farm, on his ranch, but not allowing any others to do it. And this rancher was astute enough and not so fast on the gun to go, oh my gosh, this is cool stuff. I have other cool stories, but we could go on and on. But I wanted to share. Okay, sharing with you, carnivores live. Okay, carnivores lived here. In, um, Kugels once lived here in Maine, all right? They are coming back. And it's really important to our farmers to know they are coming back. And most, probably the ones who are here um, are all young males. And they've come from South, Car uh, South Dakota, come a long way. They're looking for their girl. And they're probably not going to find her. Because the females tend to have their territories real close to their moms. So be, know that they are here but also know that their prey that they are really looking for 
are deer. They are the deer hunters, all right? And of course, we need them here. Help our deer herds be, our deer herds be very, very healthy. They're part of that role of keeping deer herds really healthy, okay? Also the fox story, I could tell you all those stories about them too. But foxes had a long history of like getting into the chicken coop. And let me tell you, this mother's the foxes say, okay, kids, come on, I'm gonna show you where you can go. You come over to these chickens, all right? And this is kind of, this is the taste I'm giving you. So sometimes foxes can be actually far more difficult than other predators to deal with. Also because of all the amazing work of a past um, of Rachel Carson, now we have our great avian predators. These predators you see here are owls, our hawks, our eagles. They can take out a chicken, no problem. No problem, okay? The other thing is that another thing is our guardian dogs. Our guardian dogs watch the sky too. It is so cool. Farmers have actually showed me, here comes the hawk. It sees the guardian dog and it goes back up again. And so these, these are powerful predators um, who, and who um, have that possibility to be there. And of course, our little bobcats, some of them are not so little. These are powerful predators in their own right as well. Thing is, coyotes talk to the dogs, to the guardian dogs, and the guardian dogs talk to coyotes. When it comes to the other predators, the guardian dogs just got to do their thing. But they talk to coyotes, and there's quite a relationship between the two of them. Coyotes get what the guardian dog's saying. These sometimes that can be more difficult. So it's really, really good that you are aware of that and see who it is. But we want our bobcats here. They play a really important role. Aha, these are the weasels, okay? These are teeny tiny little predators. They say that they give birth half-baked. Can you imagine? She has to keep her slim body. They can squeeze in like you can't believe. They have a heart rate of 250 times a minute. Can you imagine? And because of this, it's got to eat all the time, 24-7 all year long. So watch out when you want your chicken house to be very secure from her, okay? And our fishers, you want to fish here on your farm? They help protect. They are the absolute porcupine hunters and very effective. This can really help some of your farm animals too. Plus they play just all the other wonderful roles of carnivore. And raccoons, they are omnivores. And right now, as you and I are talking, they're all sleeping, Okay. They go into a slight sleep when there's when the, there's snow on the ground. Once it opens up, they will. Right? But these are powerful, intelligent predators as well. But they're mostly most of what they do is they're omnivore, very much an omnivore. So what these all have in common, they're very intelligent and adaptable. Also, they're all individuals. One coyote is not another coyote any more than each one of us sitting here today together are the same. We're all very different. They are too, and they all act differently. They require a stable life, just like you and I do. And you know what happens when kids, human kids don't have a stable life. Well, the same thing happens to carnivores. They need adequate habitat and prey. And our farms have that. And they know you better than you can imagine. And they want what you want. So your farm is not an isolated patch of land. So this is the last part of my talk, is that what's going on around your farm? And I've had experiences with farmers here in Maine. That in one area of Maine, this individual was on a killing spray of our coyotes. And when they do that, coyotes never leave their territory ever. Unless things like that happen, they're terrified. And some of their family members have been killed and they run for their lives, just like people do who run from violent places in the world. They do the same thing. And so, and they're starving. They don't know their territory. They don't know where food is. So what happens is there was a farm here in Maine, coastal Maine. This happened about a few, few days before she had, she had coyotes live all around her and the conservation area, never an issue. Two days after that, they attacked the sheep. And so when someone is killing coyotes around your farm, beware. That can be a danger to your farm because you can have coyotes coming and running from your farm 
um, and not even partially uh, and, and, and running in terror. So just be aware of that, okay? So we live in this larger community all around you, so we do. And again, we are, this is the, this is the uh, Two Coast Farm in, um, in the Harps Wells right here that you see here in May. So in closing, this is the farming with carnivoresnetwork.com. There's so much on it. Um, I've just touched the tip of the iceberg with you. And these are excellent resources. I'm gonna keep this right here when we talk. Um, Jen Donor, she is an amazing resource for you. I contact her all the time. So that's her website. She has all kinds of amazing information on there for our farmers ongoing. Also, Louise Liebenberg, she has another amazing um, blood spot that I encourage you. These are women farmers. And also there's a learning about LGD's Facebooks. These are, those are, um, there are large um, guardian dogs, Facebook. There's a Facebook page on that too, where farmers ask questions of each other. And there's some uh, people who are very, very good. And sometimes also Jan goes on it. These are valuable places for her. I highly encourage Jan Donor. And she's, I have a lot of um, her, her writings on the website as well too, that you can read through as well. Um, so as usual, I always go a little over because there's, it goes so fast. Um, so if you have any questions here, um, um, I don't know what you, what you have all of you have taken a look and seen what these are, right? Um, and if you we want to talk for a little bit of time and see each other's faces, we can do that. Too. What do you think, Chris? Because I am finished that sounds here. Good. So um, thank you so much, Jerry. This was so informative. Um, and I do plan on sending an email out with all of Jerry's good resources. So if Jerry, if you want to stop sharing, um, and then maybe we can see each other. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to just unmute yourself um, and ask a question. Um, Jerry would very much like to um, talk with you. I also have um, a survey for you to fill out because our project is grant funded um, by the USDA. Um, and so we need to report back in terms of who is um, using our program. So if you wouldn't mind filling out that survey, that would be wonderful. So I understand, you know, okay, Kat. Um, thank you, Kat. If you want to encourage that, if um, if it is an if it's an empty territory, coyotes will come. Jerry, okay. can we just um, say the question? Um, oh, I'm so sorry. So yeah, that's okay. So Kat, I can read it if you want. Okay. Yeah. So Kat asked, "How can I encourage coyotes to come to my thing?" Um, uh, my suggestion would be, first of all, you have to offer them habitat. Okay. So they need to be have a place where they feel safe and a lot of our farms have forest you know and the, just the forest in it, it doesn't have to be a really really large area because oftentimes coyote territories can be anywhere from three um three square miles to 30 square miles so if you give them some habitat where they feel comfortable there and they actually bring up their little ones there that habitat's important and prey and um also um I would, that is to be the biggest piece. And that's the piece with most species of wild animals. If you give them habitat, healthy habitat. Um, and Kat, do you have a stream anywhere on your farm? Uh, you do not. Coyotes really like streams. A reason being most probably why they're attracted to that those areas is because rodents are all over the place along streams. So it's easy hunting for them. So you have habitat for them. And also the habitat coyotes like are a forested habitat and edge. So you have the forest and then also you have the meadow. 
that's kind of like where coyotes tend to do a lot more of their hunting there. So if you have those there, and the thing is, it depends upon how long you've been. How long have you been at your farm, Kat? How long have you been there? Okay, you've been there three years. You know anything that's going on around your farm? Because I, I have to be honest, some of that, that parts are hard for me in my work because I always love being very, very positive. But you have to know that there's year-round killing of coyotes here in Maine. And there are people who love to do that. And so what it does, it's actually a really disservice to our farmers. So if there's anybody around you that's doing that, they've basically killed the coyotes who would come to your farm. And there are areas of Maine where I... As a scientist, I believe they're not because of that. So there are certain areas where, um, like I said, the one that I was talking to you about before, um, these individuals are constantly going there seeking coyotes out to kill them. And if you're a farm that's wanting to welcome them, they're not going to be there. And until, until that stops, and that's why it's really important to, to, to support them in that regard. I know that sounds, and I hope that helps. If, it's, if it's, you are if you are in an area without any coyotes, um, what might move in to take its place? Well, basically, all the other coyotes actually live with all the other species. You, you see what I mean? They oh, I think the issue that you don't have coyotes is that um, if you're a vegetable farm um, or um, a livestock farm you will have deer hanging around a lot. You're not gonna have the predator doing that role of, okay, let's be real deer now, okay? And that actually is um, a detriment to our farmers. So the whole farmers, yes, and the vegetable farmers. Um, I, there have been, some of the state has done some things, Department of Agriculture has done, and that has been one of the biggest concerns is that the deer are eating all their vegetables. What should we do about it? And it was interesting, this kind of conversation they're having. It's like, well, bring in the coyote. You know what I mean? And the thing is, if the coyotes aren't present, the deer will be. And there'll be a lot more than you want. That's why we talk about this idea of it being an ecosystem. You know, we're increasing that balance. So that's what happens when the coyote, because a little fox is not going to take out a deer. Neither does a, a fox scare a deer. Deer, deer is looking down and go, I know you, you're too little anyhow, you know, <laughs> but coyotes different. They see, they see, I believe our, our, our deer see coyotes as wolf. And that is tremendous advantage to them and us because they're really helping our deer herds be really healthy and helping our farmers too. It's a, and you see the complexity of what we're talking about here, you know? So your question is really, really a good one, Kat, because coyotes should we should have coyotes. Some coyotes will have very large territories. Some have smaller territories, depending upon food availability. It all depends on food availability. And so, but we should have, like in, say, in Baxter State Park and places like that, or if we go to Yellowstone, for instance, example. So the, the wolves of the coyotes, they, they, their territories are all right next to each other. And they're, most of them, the one in Yellowstone, they're all filled up. They're all filled up where they have to start, you know, dispersing out of Yellowstone. So it should be the same way here in Maine, that all our coyotes have a territory next to each other. And they're, they're, they're back and never with each other. But it, I, I believe it's not that way because of what? Because um, they have no protection with goes on. And it does affect our farmers. And it all affects all of us, really, in some negative ways. But I don't have and Lyme disease being one of them. So it, um, Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> So the Lyme disease is, is, a, is, a, is a big piece, too. It's kind of not present. There will really be a lot of them. And so will die coyotes. It should also help predict against Lyme disease in the farm, too, the coyotes present. So the idea of CAT is just having anyone, you know, be aware of the fact that what's going on. There, there's been times um, in certain areas, like in the Mid-Coast area, maybe about 10 years ago, there was an all-out, let's slaughter the coyotes. I hate to be so honest, but it's just how it is. And the farmers were up in odds. Uh, because everything started falling apart. So, and, and that's something that's not spoken very much. Like, we're not talking talk about this stuff. <laughs> but the thing is, I, you know, my work is carnivores. And sometimes some of the stuff I talk about, it's got to be hard. But I, but it's all the help. And sometimes it's good to have conversations like that and empower our farmers. 
So you absolutely so you're um, not an isolated parcel. You are part of a bigger system and you can be affected positively or negatively about the bigger system. Chris. Thank you so much, Jerry. I know we have just just heard the tip of the iceberg um, in terms of the information you have to share. Um, so again, I will send a follow-up email with all of Jerry's um, interesting resources um, that you can get more information about these topics. And I'm sure um, you could also contact her directly if you have any more questions. Yes, you can. Um, to, to direct get and it, Yes, you go to my website, Coyote lives in Maine.org. That's my website for all the people of Maine. Okay. And that's all kinds of stuff about coyotes and history and all that. And at the end of it is my email. Feel I I welcome emails. Very, very much so. Okay. Thank you so much, Jerry. And thanks everyone for attending. And I thank you, Chris, and I thank you, the new Fine Promise Project. I am I'm honored to be here. And I love what you're doing to support our farmers. Thank you. Well, I'm so glad that I met you at the Common Ground Fair. So, <laughs> Same here. You know I'm around. If you ever need me again, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie.